daughter has gone viral on a TikTok video. What video is this? Oh, that was TikTok. Uh, but I believe I'm live. Hey, everybody out there. It's Dave. Um, I'm getting set up slowly but surely here. <laughs> I'm uh, manning the system myself today, so hopefully I can get it all taken care of. Um, let me, uh, I'm going to turn on my other device just to see if any messages are coming in. And we'll go from there. So today we're doing a hand pan class, free hand pan class for everybody out there in YouTube land. And we're going to be having some fun just talking about hand pan and how to get started with hand pan. All right, I see four people watching. Awesome. The angels out there. There you are. All right, cool. I can see the messages now, which is nice. So I'll try to answer any questions that come up while we're online here today. Uh, absolutely, Angel, thank you for tuning in. You said getting your Luna Ohm to join you. Awesome, sweet. All right, so just, uh, I'm gonna go over a lot of basics today. So again, in, in review, well, let me start off with my traditional intro here. I'm Dave Beery, I'm David Beery, and I'm uh, the owner here at Dave's Island Instruments. And I make and tune and sell uh, hand pans like this. I started making steel drums way back when, uh, back in about 1991 was the first time I attempted making a, a steel drum. And then I made steel drums all through the 1990s and I had uh, steel drum bands and, and was selling to universities and individuals uh, for, for more than a decade. I had uh, my Smarty Pans music was my business at the time, uh, starting around 2001. Uh, and that went uh, through about 2010, and then I transferred over to Dave's Island Instruments. So now we have DII, Dave's Island Instruments. And uh, so now we're primarily selling hand pans and uh, working with people within the hand pan community. We also sell ukuleles here at the shop. So if you're here locally in the Long Beach Lakewood area, we're in Lakewood, California. And it'd be great to have you drop by or make an appointment and we can uh, help you out with anything you need. Uh, so another thing I want to just talk about uh, making sure that you subscribe to our channel so if you haven't subscribed to our channel already please do so I'm sure you probably already know where it is but there's like the little uh, red word below the screen on the left that says subscribe uh, and so you click that and subscribe to our channel and you'll get notifications of when we go live you'll get notifications when we have different videos that are uploaded and that sort of thing so it's great to have you as a subscriber thank you for everybody that already subscribed uh, and beyond that, we have a website, davesislandinstruments.com. I believe it's on the screen. Uh, so take a look at that and go to the newsletter at the bottom of the home page. You can go to the very bottom and click on the, you know, add my email to the newsletter or whatever it is uh, down at the bottom of the home page. Uh, we send out notifications of when we have either sales or, or promotions like this where we're doing live events, that sort of thing. So you get a lot of information from those email notifications. Uh, and also finally go to facebook.com facebook.com uh, and our if you go to at Dave's Island Instruments uh, like us on Facebook we also do all sorts of announcements and that sort of thing on Facebook so it'd be great to have you as a friend on Facebook all right so let me get started this is a hand pan uh, back pre-COVID we used to have hand pan classes here at DII and uh, people would come in and we would have a formal, you know, hand pan class. And so I have rental hand pans. Uh, I have one over here. Let me just show it to you. We're just real sec quick second here. This is a rental hand pan that we have. And we usually have the bottoms are painted yellow so everybody knows that it's a rental. Sounds something like that. And it's a great, great way to get started on the hand pan. Um, and uh, a lot of people get started with the rentals and so we'd have these classes at, here at DII we'd have them playing on the rentals and it was really fun so we'd talk to beginners about all the basic beginning aspects of hand pan. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm just going to be kind of doing the traditional uh, hand pan class that we used to do here pre-COVID and I've been doing these uh, kind of through the last uh, year and a half or two years online and so it's been really uh, helpful for a lot of people out there and it's really nice because we can reach people uh, remotely that are out there in the world that are not close here uh, to Southern California. So um, let me just start with the basics. Um, the basics of a handpan are it's made of metal. 
Um, this one in particular is made out of uh, just, we call it raw steel or uh, plain steel. Some people call it plain steel in the industry. We have other uh, hand pans that are made out of this gold color. It's called stainless steel. So I don't know if you can see it in the frame there. Pull it over here. So this one's uh, made of stainless steel. On this particular model, we call it the Aris, Aris uh, model hand pan. This we call it the Luna Clarity because it's got the clear finish on it. And we also have one called the Luna Satin, uh, which is has a kind of like a satin powder coated finish on it. Um, and pretty soon we're going to be unveiling our uh, uh, Gaia. We had previously, years back, made a nitrided hand pan, uh, and it was called the Gaia. So we're going to re be reintroducing the Gaia in the fall and winter, and so keep your eyes out for that. Uh, but that has a bluish kind of uh, appearance as well. All right, so this is a 20-inch model. So a lot of people uh, are still beginners to hand pans that don't know all the little details. But the diameter of this instrument is 20 inches. Uh, the Auris that we have over here, the diameter of this instrument is 21 inches, right? So that does change things a little bit from hand pan to hand pan. It changes the way the notes can be tuned on the instrument. Um, one, of the main in one of the main reasons we have different sizes is uh, sometimes you have a different a fuller sound or a different kind of sound. Uh, to the instrument, like the larger it gets or the smaller it gets, that just changes the overall timbre of the instrument. Um, and another reason a lot of customers have a, a different uh, taste in which size is some people the smaller one just fits in their lap better. Uh, some people like the larger one uh, because they like to play uh, in a, you know, maybe they're a larger person, whatever it is. So sometimes it's just, uh, just purely because it fits the person better. Um, and then uh, one of the main reasons as a tuner, uh, has a issue with the different sizes is that sometimes there's certain notes that cannot be adequately tuned on a certain size instrument. So on the 20 inch size instrument, the note that's we call it the, um, what do you call that? The wolf tone note uh, is a B natural. So a B doesn't sound very good on this instrument. And so if we move it on up to the 21 inch, then the B all of a sudden magically starts sounding good. Um, vice versa, uh, the B flat on the 21 inch size doesn't sound good, but it does sound good on the 20 inch size. So there's certain variables with the sizes that certain notes sound good or bad. Uh, it gets a little bit technical, so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, those are some of the reasons why there's different sizes. Uh, it's not all just about size and, and just being cute or large or small. Uh, there are certain technical reasons for that certain hand pan builders like myself decide to make one that's a little bit larger, a little bit uh, smaller. All right, let me take a look to see if there are any questions so far or comments. By the way, feel free to make comments. I've got everything here on my cell phone. <laughs> oh, Daniel Timtam, he logged in. Very cool. Good to see you, Daniel. And Angel's still here right on. Okay, good. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask uh, during this live class. Uh, that's why we're here to answer questions for you. Um, okay, let me uh, continue on with the discussion. So that's why we talked about some different kinds of metal. We talked about the size. Uh, the metal, by the way, uh, has different, well, I've got the two cameras, I believe, so I can just show you on the second camera here. Uh, this, the, uh, the metal sometimes has a different sound. So a plain steel has typically it has a warmer sound. <laughs> Stainless steel tends to have a lot of sustain. So it has a lot of drifting sustain on the notes. Uh, but everybody has their own preference, and so that's why we like to have different models here available at DII, it's because you can kind of pick and choose the preference that you have or the one that you like the best. Uh, so we're really happy to have these different models available to our customers. Okay, moving on. So the metal changes kind of like the sound overall. It doesn't really change the tuning. It just kind of changes the sound a little bit. Um, uh, this one, again, was plain steel. We call this the Luna Clarity. The top shell, they're made out of basically two shells of metal. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, basically made out of two shells of metal. There's the top shell and the bottom. Right here along the seam, it was the two shells were glued together. So I've got a little piece of rubber that connects the two, kind of protects it and um, hides the edge a little bit. You can see that. Let's see. Uh, there it is. 
There it is, right. So you can kind of move that away and just take a look at the rim if you need to, but you can see that it's been glued together. That's the traditional way of uh, putting them together. You don't weld them. Welding is more permanent. Um, and so we've got the top shell that has all of these tone field notes on it. Some people call them tone fields. Other people call them notes. My, my personal go-to word is notes because I'm uh, previously a t uh, steel drum tuner, so I just called them notes. Uh, Handpan tuners sometimes call them uh, tone fields. So I just combine those two, call it tone field notes, make it easy for everybody. Uh, there's basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tone field notes on this handpan. On this stainless steel over there, it's got nine, so it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, people out in the handpan world see all sorts of different variations of handpans, and you're going to see like lots of notes or fewer notes and that sort of thing. Um, this one even has notes on the bottom, right? You can see some of these tone field notes on the bottom. So it extends the range of the instrument, so you can play it uh, with the top notes. And you can also play the bottom notes like that. So it's a really fun instrument. You can uh, get a lot done with uh, just the notes that are available right there. All right, so uh, the top note here on the, oh wait, I think I got a comment. I want to look at that comment, see if anybody has a question. Let's see, Adrian Mendonca, I had to switch to phone to say hello and thank you for making such a wonderful instrument. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you absolutely for tuning in today. Thanks for the comment. If you have any questions, feel free to ask while we're online today. Um, that's great, I'm really glad to hear from you, Adrian. Okay, so uh, again, so the top note here is called the ding note. It's the biggest one in the center. It's got the bass sound of the instrument. You can see I'm playing it just with a single finger right now. Sometimes I play it with kind of the bottom of my knuckle of my index finger or the bottom part of my knuckle on my middle finger. Some people play them with their thumbs. That sort of thing. You can see the tone field notes around the perimeter of the note uh, or the, the drum. I typically play them with the flat part of my hand like this. Just like that. And some people ask, uh, what are these little divot things here? What are these little dents? And these are called dimples. So that's the official note, uh, a name for these uh, little dents in the metal. They're called dimples. And those basically kind of control the sound a little bit and make it a mellower sound. As opposed to a steel drum. A steel drum does not have those uh, dimples, and so it has a brighter sound. So that's one reason why those dimples are there. And then other people ask, do you actually aim for the dimple when you play it? To some degree, yes. Uh, it gets the most full sound out of the instrument um, because it's activating all of the different harmonics that are tuned to each note. And uh, one thing I want to show you, well, I can show you. I keep forgetting that I have this secondary camera above here. Uh, one thing I can show you is that most of these are kind of have an oval shape to them. So it has the long part of the note and then the short width, right? So even this one on the top, even though it looks a little bit more circular, it still has kind of an oval shape to it. Let me see if I can position it in a different way. There we go. So the length of the note and then the width of the note. So each note has basically three pitches that are tuned to it. There's the fundamental pitch, which if you hit the center of the note, it basically produces that basic fundamental sound that you want to hear from that note. So for instance, this ding note is a D. So when I hit in the middle, it basically produces that D sound. Same thing over here, that's a D, it produces the D sound. Over here is an E. By hitting in the middle, it basically produces that E sound. Now, uh, extended techniques, uh, can you can start playing the, uh, the different harmonics that are tuned to each note. So the ding note, you can hear how it bends a little bit there. Uh, and then you're going to find a different spot. On every hand pan is a slightly different. You find the sweet spot like that. So basically I'm backtivating the fifth that was tuned through the width of the note. So I'm muting here, basically the octave, touching really close to the ding, the dimple, and then activating it. But I'm also pushing down slightly on this note here. 
So I'm activating that fifth harmonic and then pressing on the note with my left hand and kind of dipping it up and down and it kind of creates that cool sound. Right? Uh, then you can also activate the octave. It's a little bit lower sound. La 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 la. And then the fifth. And that works with all of the different notes. Uh, so let's just try it on the E. So you've got the E, and you've got the octave, and you've got the fifth over here. La, la, and then la, way up there, right? So you can learn how to play these different harmonics on the instrument by striking the notes in different spots. So this is getting a little bit beyond like the beginner aspect of how to play a handpan, but I just wanted to give you like an overview of how the handpan can be utilized to create different sounds and, and ways of playing it that create music in different ways. So that you don't feel like you're just constrained to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight notes. You actually have eight notes plus all the octaves plus all the fifths. Any other other kind of fun sounds that you can get out of the instrument by like a, a slapping in the interstitial metal here like that. So there's all sorts of fun stuff you can do with a handpan. Some of those are some of the basics. I'm going to talk about uh, how to strike the note in just a second. Let me take a look at these uh, comments, because I believe we've got some comments on online right now. I've been seeing some come up. So let's see. Angel says, I noticed that if you have notes in the bottom, the notes can get muted if the with the stand. Yes, de definitely. You have to make sure that if there's notes on the bottom of the handpan, that the stand is set in just the right way where it avoids the notes. And we uh, basically you can do that. Sometimes it just takes a little while to get it adjusted. For instance, over here, uh, I typically like to put the stand, one of the legs of the stand, right here between these two notes. These two, let's see if you can see there. So I like to put the stand like right here. And then the other two legs typically are on the opposite side of this low F. So if you have uh, an instrument like this, one of, one of ours, either a Luna 11 or, a, or an RS-12, I usually just kind of put my hand on these two notes. You can see what I'm doing there. And then as I'm lowering it onto the stand, I just kind of feel for that leg. And I go, okay, that's the, pretty much the position that it needs to be in so that that leg is not touching those notes on the bottom. Uh, with the uh, Ohm, with our Ohm hybrid handpan, I don't have one here as a sample to show you, but it has the top handpan notes and then the bottom we have tongues, like a tongue drum. Uh, that one also needs to be positioned, uh, especially when you flip it over to play the tongues on the bottom. Uh, the top notes, you need to make sure that they're positioned so that none of these legs are, are touching the, the notes on the opposite side. So that's just something to be aware of, and after a while you become pro at it and you'll figure it out. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's something to be aware of. All right, let me take a look at some more questions here. Um, well, one, one way to bypass the, uh, the bottom notes being muted by the stand, of course, you could play it in your lap and figure out exactly how to just position it on your lap. Like, for instance, my legs, sometimes I will put them together like this and position it just on the edges of the um, goo. By the way, I don't think I told all the beginners out here, this hole in the bottom is called the goo hole, G-U. Sometimes I call it a base port or a port, but the official name that was given to it uh, years ago is goo. And the top note here is called the ding. So that's just a couple little terms that you might want to be aware of. All right, let's see if there's a few more here. Uh, Alvaro got on here. Let's see, Alvaro says, hey Dave, how problematic are major, minor, second next to each other? What if they are on, If what if, they are one on top shell and other on the bottom right. Okay, I think this is a tuning question, so not so much of like a beginning handband class. But let me just go into it just a little bit since I've got you online. Uh, so yes, so I believe if you're talking about, let's say this is an F natural, and on the bottom shell you want to put a F sharp, which is just a half step away. Yes, you might get some conflict there. So when you play this note, it actually might resonate the F sharp on the bottom a little bit, which causes dissonance. So um, but you have to kind of play with it. It's not something that you just immediately can say yes or no to. Um, for instance, over on my instruments, I've got an E natural over here. On the bottom, I have an F, but it's an octave below this E. So it, the distance is quite wide. So I do have basically like a half step, an F to an E, E to F. 
but I think it works really well because they're pretty far apart. If the F on the bottom was the same octave as this E, then it might cause some dissonance. So I, you would have to play with it though. Every hand pan maker is slightly different and hand pans are made differently. So it's not really uh, something that you can just simply say yes or no to. It's, it's something that you have to experiment with. Hey, Jimmy Gibbs is on. Uh, he says, thanks for the class. Uh, do you have classes on microphone setups? You know what? Uh, I don't think I've had a class specifically on microphone setups. I did do one with John Ballinger, I don't know, about six months ago, I think. And uh, he's a uh, recording artist here in LA and he's done all sorts of production and that sort of thing. And, and we had him on line with, um, with a singer that did a handpan song with handpan in it. And I was actually the guy who like recorded it in the studio. And I recall they had some, you know, nice microphones on me. We did talk about microphone setup a little bit, but uh, John, he's still a little bit um, new to handpans, so it's not like he's been done a ton of handpan recordings. So we just used the best mics we had possible for that recording session. Uh, but in general, uh, what I've found that I like is uh, typically like a stereo sound. So um, if I have two microphones pointed kind of like this. Uh, not too close. I found that if the microphones are too close, that when my hand moves across the instrument, you hear how that has that wavy sound? That's a really cool sound when you want it. But if you don't want it, as you're playing a recording, all of a sudden it has this weird sound. And since the microphone is closer, it picks it up even more. So it has a sound that it almost sounds like there's a mistake going on. So uh, my personal preference is to have the mics, I don't know, two or three feet above the instrument. Um, also, if you wanted to get some of the bass sound out of the, the goo port on the bottom, you might want to have a microphone coming up from the bottom um, so that you can get that goo sound. Uh, the goo sound has different bass tones that come out of it. This one here is about, is about an F. You can probably hear that a little bit. If you put your hand into it, you can change the pitch. Doo -wee, oo -wee, oo -wee. Right? So you can do all sorts of fun stuff. You can also position your legs to create different bass sounds by basically making the diameter of that, um, that hole larger or smaller. So that's another thing for recording. Uh, let's see, as far as dynamic microphones or, or Condenser microphones, uh, I think that's kind of up to what you're trying to do with it. Uh, usually outdoors, you might want to use a, uh, depends on what you want to hear. Condenser microphones tip typically pick up sounds from all over the place, like across the room, or if there's a bird flying by and chirping, you can hear the bird. Uh, dynamic microphones typically focus the sound on the instrument and kind of keep all of those extra sounds away from the recording. So again, it, it it's going to be an experiment, but I don't have any specific microphones that I would say that I would use on a regular basis. I mean, just the ones that I own myself. Um, so <laughs> I wish I had a little bit more. We'll have to do that. We'll have to have an episode specifically on miking hand pans. I like that idea. So thank you, Jimmy. Uh, oh, lead pans here. And I think I knew who lead pan is uh, Peter, right? <laughs> uh, he says, will bending off office by pressing take out of tune? Let's see. Pressing, bending, octaves. Oh, octaves. Uh, oh, so yeah, so when I was just showing you just a second ago how to do that little pitch bend, by pushing it down here, will that put it out of tune? That was the concern. Uh, from my experience doing it this way, it does not put it out of tune. I've never really had any issues with that whatsoever. Interestingly, if you do, uh, let's say you're transporting your instrument, let's say it's in a backpack even, and you put it in your back of your car and there's a bunch of luggage in there and then you take your door and for some reason it doesn't quite fit everything in. you just decide to push that door you know tightly against everything and just squish everything into that car or the trunk of your car you push the trunk and you you squish everything down sometimes that compressive force will put the ding note out of tune so you do have to be careful not to compress that too much but i think the pressure that you're using just with your finger isn't enough to cause any problems with the tuning. I've never had any of that experience. You can even kind of put pressure on some of these side notes. Kind of create some cool effects. You see how it bends the note a little bit? Doesn't work on all of the notes, but you can kind of find the notes that it works on and uh, have some fun with that. 
So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I would mostly worry about uh, larger compression, like squishing it with a door, a trunk, or uh, allow, allowing a hand pan to fall or something like that. That's a good question. Okay, Angel says thanks. Right on, Angel. Uh, Jeff Brown, thanks for uh, tuning in. Jimmy Gibbs, awesome, thank you. All right, you guys, thank you so much for your questions. Um, I really appreciate it. It makes this uh, stuff really more interactive and fun for not only for you, but for me. Uh, it gives me more to talk about, and I think it really becomes an effective way of communicating all of the subtleties of the hand pan to the community at large. So thank you for those questions. Keep them coming. It's always nice to see those questions. All right, we were just talking about the way the hand pan was set up. So far, all of you beginners out there, sometimes you're wondering about you know where the positions of the notes are, but one of the primary questions is how do you hit the note? How do you strike it to create that beautiful sound? Well, like I said before, I typically kind of strike my hand pan with a flat hand pan or with flat fingers. Like this, the, it, my finger basically strikes the note and bounces off like immediately. You can kind of hear the slap of my hand, right? So I'm slapping my hand and immediately coming off. You can still get that slap sound if your finger stays on your hand, right? So you still get a slap sound. But what I want you to do is slap your hand and then immediately come off of that hand, right? So you're doing basically the same thing here. You might notice even this part of my hand here is almost resting on the metal just outside of where the note is. tends to be my method of playing. Uh, some people play with the tips of their fingers, so I haven't actually cut my fingernails for a little while, so you might hear some ticky-tack from my fingernails, but some people will hit like that with the tips of their fingers. Kind of creates a warm sound. It has a little bit less of the ticky-tacky sound that you get, the attack uh, of when you hit with a flat finger. So it is actually kind of fun to experiment with both of those methods because you can get different sounds out of the instrument. So for instance, like if you're just playing a scale, that's one sound, and that's another sound. So I played it with flat finger first and then with the tips of my fingers second. So you can create just different sounds and textures by using different parts of your finger to play. You can also use your thumbs. Some people really like playing with their thumbs. Um, I tend to only use my thumb when I'm playing two notes at a time. So for instance, on the notes over here, I'm playing one note with my index finger and the other note, I'm striking that A with my thumb. Same thing over here, I'm gonna play the C and the E. And you can notice there, my the rotary action of my hand is kind of coming into play. So it's not completely up and down, it's a little bit of a rotary motion. You can experiment with all sorts of things and how to play it uh, on your own, but those are just some methods that I employ to create the sounds out of the instrument. Um, uh, let's see. All right, so one way to kind of practice that and get started, I think I just saw a comment come on screen, so let me take a look. Adrian, right on. Okay, let's see. Uh, it says, a little silicone or uh, are little silicone or rubber mallets like the fingertip ones okay to use? Is there a better material to seek out? So yeah, you can use mallets, uh, rubber mallets. Oh, can you use sport, sports tape on fingers? Sure, yeah, that was another question. So let me just answer the sports tape first. So yeah, you could wrap your uh, finger with sports tape, absolutely. It might take a little of that um, uh, attack off, so it might have a warmer sound, which might be ideal for what you want to have. Um, so that'd be great. Uh, I don't see any problem with that. Even if there's some residue of the glue or whatever got onto the instrument, you could probably pretty much easily wipe that away. It shouldn't be too much of a problem. Uh, by the way, speaking of residues and wiping things off of hand pans, uh, I would uh, suggest before using any solution of any sort to clean off your instrument, test it on a small spot, uh, maybe on the rim that's like unnoticeable uh, or that sort of thing, just to make sure that like if you let it sit for an hour, you wipe it and then come back an hour, did it do anything to the finish? Did it affect the finish? You don't want to use something like alcohol or um, uh, acetone. <laughs> on a handpan 
uh, because there's, I mean, alcohol, occasionally you can use it on certain things. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So there's like all of these different hand pans have different kinds of metal and different ways that they've been finished. So sometimes they've been powder coated, sometimes they've been painted, sometimes they have nitriding, sometimes they have stainless steel, all that sort of thing. Each one of those different kind of metals and different kind of processes will be affected differently by the kind of cleaning uh, solution that you use on your hand pan. I've made a couple uh, videos in the past uh, that show what kind of cleaning agents I've used uh, and I'm going to be pr uh, producing another one pretty soon that talks about uh, how to clean uh, stainless steel and the things you need to be careful of. But uh, just in general, just that's basically what I do. Before I use anything, I just use it on a small spot just to take a look to see if it's going to affect it or, or stain it or remove it, uh, the finish. So just be very careful with those kind of cleaners. Uh, usually I've found that the easiest, simplest cleaner to use for most hand pans is uh, like glass cleaner, uh, just like uh, Windex or something like that. It usually takes away the grease, it usually takes away any kind of dirt, uh, but it's not super duper harsh and it's not really uh, abrasive at all. Just make sure that it's if it, on any hand pan that you just wipe it off completely so that it's not wet. You don't want it to stay wet because even if, even if the hand pan uh, is super duper protected like with this powder coated finish, this is really durable finish, it's just good policy just not to leave it wet. It's kind of like leaving a guitar. You wouldn't want to put your guitar back in its case if like you just wiped it down with something wet. <laughs> so it's the same kind of idea. Or a violin. You wouldn't want a violin to go into case when it's all wet, right? So just make sure it's dry. Same kind of process. All right, let's get back to the other question. I think we have the question about mallets. And I don't have a mallet here with... Let me go get a mallet. I've got some mallets in the back. I'll be right back. Here I come with my mallets. Here I come. I know. It's funny having me off screen. Okay, so here's a bamboo mallet that we sometimes will include with our ohm hybrid drums. It's very light, uh, very simple mallet. It's not meant to really hit hard. It just kind of creates a nice mellow sound. This is similar to a steel drum mallet. Steel drums are played with mallets. They're not played with the hands. And uh, this was, I don't know, five inches long, maybe six inches at most. And it has a latex tip on it. So latex is a, a pretty good material to use. It kind of has a nice warm sound. This is an aluminum mallet, again, from like a steel drum kind of mallet. It has latex on it, it's a little longer. And then this is just a wooden dowel, like a half inch diameter uh, hickory dowel, I believe. And again, it has the the latex on it. Now this latex is kind of old and so it's gotten a little harder. You're going to probably notice it has a more harsh sound because that latex is old and not as so soft. So I probably wouldn't suggest something like this. Um, but uh, mallets, as long as they're kind of small, uh, this one's probably the longest I would want to use. This is maybe seven inches long, uh, up to eight maybe. Um, this is probably the longest I would, would suggest. Because you don't want, it's okay if like you know how to use the mallets, but sometimes if you have mallets sitting next to the instrument and somebody else, one of your friends walks up and they don't know how to play, they'll, or a child or something like that, they'll just start wailing on it and they could ultimately damage it. Truthfully, I, I wouldn't be concerned about the tuning of the instrument as far as playing it with mallets because I use mallets to tune the instruments before I sell them. And I actually hit them very, very hard uh, by snapping the mallet on the note to make sure that it stays in tune, that it doesn't drift out of tune. Uh, so I'm not so worried that the notes would go out of tune when a mallet is hitting the note. It would be more so that somebody uses the wrong side, like this end doesn't have the rubber tip on it. Next thing you know, they hit it and it makes a big scar uh, in the finish or a scratch or something like that. Um, or like a child might just hit it really, really hard and like damage the instrument. It's potentially a possible that if you use the, the metal part or the wood part of the mallet and hit it on the edge of a note, it could potentially put it out because of the, the force of the hard uh, wood or the dowel and the, uh, the um, metal. But if you just use the tips with the rubber latex, it shouldn't be a big deal at all. Um, again, like I said, uh, the smaller, the lighter, probably the better. Um, if you get a little larger, it does produce a little bit of a warmer tone. But like I said, you just don't want to get it too large. You don't want to make it um, something that could uh, be problematic in the future with friends and family and that sort of thing. 
All right, see if there are any other questions here. You guys are really talkative today. Thank you so much for all of your questions. I'm really enjoying all of this interaction. Okay, so yeah, great. Feel free to continue with those questions. You guys have them. Uh, I was talking about how to play the hand pan, so frequently people want to know how to produce that sound. So I was just talking about the couple, couple different methods of playing the hand pan that work for me. Uh, one way I get people started is I just have, a simp do, have them do a simple exercise, and I just have them hit four times on the ding with their right hand, four times with their left hand, and an exercise like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I'm going kind of fast right now, actually. So if you're a beginner, you might want to take it about half this speed, like one, two, two, three, four. And what you're looking for here is you're looking for just the striking of the note with your finger, making sure your finger comes off of that note. So I'm not sure if you can see how my finger comes off of that note on the video. You can a little bit. It just falls down on the note and then immediately off. And then the second thing what you're listening for is you're listening for the sustain of the note. So you want to make sure that the note has a nice sustain. It strikes and it sustains. Strike and sustain. Strike and sustain. Strike and sustain. And that kind of thing. So if you can get that sustain going, that's really where you're going to get the beauty of the instrument. So you can play it basically back and forth four times on each hand. One, two. And really there's no reason you have to go fast or slow. It, this is just a a process. You have training your body and training your hands and your muscles how to get a nice sound out of the instrument. So after you kind of get comfortable with that, you can move over to the other notes here on the side. Like this is the E on the left. And it's basically the same exercise. looking for that striking the note, letting the finger come off of the note, and then looking for the sustain after that. So here, let me give you a couple examples of uh, ways I've seen people make mistakes or not get the best sound out of a note. So sometimes people will strike the note uh, like this. They'll kind of grab at the note, like kind of a grabbing motion, like this. And that is usually problematic. Because you can see that there's no sustain, right? So you can hear that the note is producing a sound, but it's not sustaining. So watch out for that grabbing motion. It's interesting because that grabbing motion is very close to the tapping motion that I showed you earlier. tapping motion is more of a downward tap, again, where your finger hits the surface and immediately comes off of it. The grabbing is more of a, a sideways motion. So try not to grab it with that sideways motion. If you do use that motion, just make sure it's kind of going more straight up and down. So that's one little detail. Um, you can do this. I'm not saying you can't do it. Uh, for instance, you could use that as a sound effect way. So for instance, I'm going to start with my normal technique use that little grabbing technique to create some different sound. <laughs> right? So it's just interesting. It's not like you can't do it, but what I'm getting at is if you want to have that nice full sound. So I suggest not using that technique for that full sound for getting like a regular uh, sound out of the hand pan. So those are some techniques if you want to again use your thumbs. Um, you can also do that same exercise. One, two, three, four, one. I'm going fast again, right? Just to show you want to get that thumb to strike it and then come off of it immediately. Uh, you'll notice that this is a different technique because it uh, produces that rotation of the wrist rather than going with gravity. Uh, so by the way, I use gravity a lot, just allowing my hand to kind of fall so I'm not forcing it down with my muscles. That's kind of another problem I see sometimes with people is, is that you can see that they're very stiff and they're, they're forcing it down with their muscles. <laughs> it's almost hard for me to do. <laughs> It's hard for me to replicate that one. But uh, just relax. Your shoulders should be relaxed. Uh, your arms should be relaxed. There should be a little bit of stiffness in your wrist just because you can't let your wrist just flop there. You don't want to do that, right? So it needs to be a little bit stiff right there, kind of like a spring. But then I just l allow gravity to kind of pull my hand down. 
strike the note. So that's actually an interesting thing because the notes that are on the bottom, for anybody that has notes on the bottom shell, it's actually something you have to adjust to and get used to when you're hitting the notes on the bottom shell. Like right now I'm actually using the tips of my fingers. I kind of like to use the tips of my fingers on the bottom notes. But now you're going away from gravity. So you actually have to put a little bit more force toward twisting your fingers uh, and hitting that note. So sometimes those notes on the bottom require a little bit of a different technique and, and it takes a little while to warm up to getting those sounds uh, the way you want them. So just be aware that those bottom notes can be a little bit tricky to get started with. Right then I started using the flat part of my hand. It just felt right. And also you can kind of see I'm twisting. There's a little bit of a twist. Depends on where the note is located. But really you're trying to be uh, conserving as much energy as possible, so moving between these notes. So just try to make it like a little quick little twist. That sort of thing. And that should help you out. Alright, so those are some basic ideas of how to get the sounds out of the instrument. So we've talked about the materials, how they're made, talked about like the size of the instruments, uh, talked about um, kind of cleaning it and maintaining it, uh, we talked about the techniques of playing it. So let me just give you a couple ideas of some melodies and that sort of thing of how to play melodies and create some melodies for yourself. Let me just double check to see if any questions have come in. Oh, is there an arpeggios exercise? Yeah, arpeggios, uh, so for those of you out there that don't have musical um, training, an arpeggio is basically uh, kind of like saying you have fingers. <laughs> uh, but it would be going from one finger to the next finger like this. From low to high. Right, let's see if you can see it on screen better. So I've got fingers, and you can play them individually, right? One, beam. Boom, whatever, you could play those separately, all the same note over and over again. But if you go from low to high, dun, 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 that's called an arpeggio. Uh, and it usually outlines a chord. So luckily, on the hand pan, uh, we've got some very basic chords that are, you don't even need to know music history or uh, theory or anything like that. You can just look at the visually on the right hand side of the instrument is a D minor arpeggio. It's really set up for you like that it's just easy so you go from the largest one towards your belly all the way up to the smallest one right so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit I'm gonna show you the basic scale first uh, in, a, in a minute but let me just briefly go over this since the question was asked so on the right hand side you've got this nice D minor ar arpeggio on the other side you have an A minor or sometimes you can talk about C major but if you start on that same low note Again, it's kind of this arc of notes right here. So you can start on this side, go to the other side, go back, go back. So that's one arpeggio uh, exercise you could use on the hand pan that'd be very pretty easy. If you wanted to, you could extend that to using the ding. All those same notes but you're adding the ding same thing over here all right and I'm going a little bit fast for the beginners out there it's okay I'm just trying to gloss over some ideas to get your uh, brain spinning a little bit and give you some ideas to work with um, okay so those are just some arpeggio ideas and that's a little bit advanced for some of the beginners but I want to show you now the basic scale of the hand pan so the basic scale, I usually start on my left hand. This is an eight note, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and it's made in a way where if you start on your left hand and you go back and forth between your hands, so left, right, left, right, left, right, which is like an alternating pattern, you can play all of the notes in sequence and it works out just fine. It goes from low to high. So let's try that. It's gonna go left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. So once again, let's take a look at that. Left, 
right, left, right, left, right, left, right. You can kind of speed that up a little bit. And this scale, just the way it is, kind of meditative as it is. So you could practice this slowly, quietly. You can go back and forth. You can speed it up and slow it down. You can play it softly. You can gradually get louder. And then quietly get, or gradually get quieter again. You can start quiet and get louder and slower at the same time. So using the quiet and soft, uh, fast and slow, those ideas are really great for practice, especially if you don't want to get a little bit bored with just doing one thing over and over again. So take that simple thing, that basic, this is the basic scale of the, of the top shell of the handpan. You can just go all the way up I'm just alternating my hands, left, right, left, right, left, right. And just make it a little bit more exciting for yourself by making it quiet or soft or loud or fast or slow. You can even make part of it fast and part of it slow. Right? You can do all sorts of fun stuff just with this basic idea and it'll give you something to work with, something to practice. Uh, and all of a sudden you're probably going to come up with some new ideas and musical ideas of your own. Uh, that you're going to be able to play for your friends, and that, that's, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, so that's just your basic scale, uh, and hitting the notes in the different directions. You can also go from high to low. So let's say this is from low to high. You could start on this note and go backwards. Like, keep that going over and over again. Right, so those are all good things to practice, so, so you get used to going up and down the scale. Uh, and not being like uh, thrown off by like where the notes are, where your hands are, and that sort of thing. So those are good pr things to practice. There's another thing I like to show people is just how to use this metal between the notes. So the notes themselves, these tone-filled notes are very resonant, uh, and we haven't talked about the space between the notes. The space between the notes is called the interstitial metal, basically the metal between the notes. You can find it in all sorts of different locations, uh, towards the rim, Usually the little triangle areas that are between the notes are most ideal. Like a little triangle over there, a little triangle over here. I mean, in my brain, I see them as little triangles. Let's see, like that. <clears throat> so those are usually pretty ideal spots to strike the interstitial metal, or over here, there's like a little bit of a triangle uh, that you can see over on the edge there. So those are ideal places to strike the metal. So what you want to do here is actually the opposite action as what you've learned on uh, by hitting the notes. So what I've told you before with hitting the notes is to strike the note quickly and come off of that note. So your finger comes off of the note, right? So in this case, what you actually want to do when you're striking the metal here is you actually want to strike it and keep your finger on the steel, like this. And that creates that snapping sound. Yeah, you can kind of create that sound by just slapping it like this coming on and off the metal but it has a little bit of a lighter sound that's not quite as snappy. Um, and so I like to strike the metal and just leave my finger on that metal. So I'm gonna show you just this simple pattern that we call the Austin Funk. It's a lot of fun to play, um, and it's just something simple to get warmed up to. And it combines not only the, the pattern that I'm gonna show you here, but it also combines a little bit of the notes on the edges where you can practice getting your hands uh, with playing the notes with the regular, um, technique. All right, so you can play the ding note, one, and then two is over here. So left note, left hand, right hand, and on the right hand, again, you're snapping it on that inter interstitial metal. So left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left, right. So let's try getting that going. So that's basically the pattern. So we're going to do that three times in the row, I believe. And on the fourth time, we're going to play the C and the D. 
And if you want to count the notes rather than know the letter names, one, two, three, four. So you can count three and four. One, two, three, four. So it'll be note number three and four. Uh, and we're going to play dun, 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 like that. C, D, C, D. Or if you want to prefer the numbers, three, four, three, four. So it's going to sound like this. The whole thing's going to sound like this. Left, right, left, left, right. Second time. Left, left, right. Third time. And we're going to stop here. Lift your hands just for a second. And then left, right, left, right. So when I told you to lift your hands, we're, I'm going to call that a rest. Because you're going to rest. You're not going to play anything during at that point. So let's try it again. I'm just going to play it normally this way as if I was just playing it without explaining it. So you can hear how it sounds. Was the whole pattern. This is the second time through. Left, left, right, two, left, three. Stop, lift, left, right, left, right. Again, I'm only really saying to lift your hands just to kind of make it obvious that you're not supposed to play there. You don't have to lift your hands. You could just rest like this. Rest. Left, right, left, right. Usually I take that rest as a moment to move my hands into position to play the other notes. Move your hands left, right, left, right. And then move them back to the ding note. So this is a really good one just to get people started. I always talk about this is like your first rhythm that you would play it if you were to play at a coffee shop. So unless you're playing at your coffee shop for your first gig ever, because you just got your hand pan, you're really excited to play for your friends. And this is something you can play as people are walking into the coffee shop and you can talk because it's not too bad to play and, and uh, talk while you're playing this one. <laughs> and you can say hi to your friends, hey Joe, welcome to the coffee shop. Don't forget to put uh, money in my tip jar. So you can do stuff like that, it'd be fun. So this is once again called the Austin Funk, very simple. So it's also something you could use between. Let's say you were doing some other kind of uh, little melody thing. And then you want to break it up a little bit. things along so you start with a melody and you go into that rhythm and maybe later you would stop doing the rhythm and going into like another pattern and doing something different there so it's just nice to have a rhythm that you can play and like uh, funnel yourself to and uh, it just helps the music move along in a different way uh, other than just playing the notes on the hand pan so that's pretty much it let me check for any other questions I think that's kind of it for the class today uh, let's see if anybody has any questions here Dun, 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 dun. All right, looks like it's about it. Can I do double stroke each note? Oh, okay, yeah, could you do like a double stroke kind of like on a, again, a kind of a music school drum lesson question. Uh, so sometimes on drums you play, play two notes at the same time, kind of fast. And yeah, you could do that. Even, uh, there's even like this cool thing where you can uh, kind of move quickly from one to the next. Uh, I can do it better with my right hand. Like that. So if you do that, that's kind of a fun little thing you can do. So I'm playing left, right, right, left. If I practice more, I could probably do it with my left hand. A little bit. So that's just something fun I've learned how to do just going between notes, um, and that's just over here, but I'm sure you can kind of figure out how to do different things. Maybe you just use those two fingers on one note. All right now I'm using my 
uh, ring finger and my index, index finger. I'm sure you could use just the two here. Yep. <laughs> all sorts of fun. So yeah, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with the hand pan. Uh, this is just a beginning intro course to kind of get you started and get your juices flowing for how to play and a couple different techniques and different uh, scale ideas and rhythm ideas. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. It's really great to have so many comments today. Uh, and, uh, it always makes it more interactive and more fun for me and for the audience out there. It gives them all sorts of stuff to absorb and learn. So since I'm running the show today, I'm going to do that awkward thing of like reaching over to turn off the live show with the mouse because it's across the room. But thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll see you the next time. Uh, I believe Daniel's going to be out of town next week, so we're not going to have the ukulele uh, live class, I believe. I might substitute. Not sure. So watch next week. I might have something going on next week at 1 o'clock p.m. on Saturday. Otherwise, I'm going to be doing this again the following Saturday at 1 o'clock p.m. Hope you all can be there. Tell a friend. See you next time. All right, here I'm going to go do that other really awkward thing and turn off the live show. <laughs> here we go. Where is it? Finish. End broadcast. See ya.